Okay, good morning, friends. Uh, apologies for the uh, technical issue. Uh, my name is Vijay Singh. Um, I would like to thank BIOS uh, for running these um, excellent uh, webinar series. I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, all the faculty members. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Saurabh Agarwal, who is a shoulder and elbow surgeon at Princess Royal Hospital in uh, Orpington. Uh, we got um, Mr. Roger Van Reed, who unfortunately cannot make it today, he's unwell, uh, who's a well-known elbow surgeon based in London and um, Belgium. Then we've got Mr. Joydeep Padnis, who's a um, consultant uh, shoulder and elbow surgeon at uh, Brighton University Hospital. And we have Mr. Jagwan Singh, who's a um, consultant orthopedic surgeon shoulder and elbow at um, Lewisham Hospital. We have four excellent talks. Um, at this point, I would remind you to put your questions through the Q&A section. Uh, because this is a webinar format, um, please, you will not be able to ask questions uh, verbally. Um, and so the faculty will try and respond to the Q&A in the Q&A section. Try not to use the chat section. Uh, at the end, the webinar will be available on uh, the BIOS YouTube channel. Uh, one more uh, thanks is to Ortho TV, who are streaming this live across uh, the world um, in many parts. Um, the first talk is on elbow anatomy and approaches by um, Saurabh. Thank you, BIOS, for your kind invitation. I'm Saurabh Agarwal, upper limb surgeon at Princess Royal University Hospital. So my topic today is elbow anatomy and approaches uh, for the FRCS auth exams. Right, so there are four extensor and four flexor muscles. These are the dynamic stabilizers. So extensors are ECU, EDM, EDC, and ECRB. Flexors are pronator teres, FCR, Omaris longus, and FCU. Static stabilizers, lateral and medial ligament. Lateral ligament, three parts, radial collateral, annular, and LUCL. LUCL, relevant and important. Uh, if uh, in terrible triad situation, it doesn't heal properly or not repaired properly, it can give rise to posterolateral rotatory instability. On the medial side, MCL again has three parts, your anterior band, posterior, and your oblique band. Anterior band, more important, Origin is anterior inferior to the epicondyle. Anterior band is inserted on the sublime tubercle on the anteromedial facet. Then lateral approaches, caucus, modified caucus, EDC split, and Keplon. For exam purposes, few things. One, start with consent, relevant risks, relevant nerve, then your who list, positioning, landmarks, internervous plane and bring one approach uh, which you've seen and familiar with and discuss that. But we'll talk about sort of all the possible approaches. So caucus, your internervous plane is anconius and ECU. So I would always mark my anconius. So bony landmarks are olecranon, epicondyle, a 0.6 centimeter distal to olecranon. So when I join these dots, that's this triangle represents anconius muscle. So the muscle in front will be ECU. So when I cut on this line, as I've done here, I've gone through the caucus internervous plane. Then fascia, unlike medial side, on the lateral side, it's a strong structure. So you incise and repair it in the end as a separate entity to prevent muscle herniation. And then inside, I put my thumb on radial head, I rotate the forearm and then cut at the equator or slightly anterior to it. So again, indications would be your radial head fractures, your terrible triads, your septic arthritis to the elbow. And in this case, of course, I've replaced it and some transosseous drills for lateral ligament repair. Uh, so picture on the left, that's my caucus. Now remember with caucus, I am also cutting my LUCL in line of fibers. So to avoid that, if I go in the front, and cut my capsule a bit anterior, I will preserve my LUCL. So this becomes a modified caucus approach. 
EDC split will be further anterior through the EDC muscle. So this paper compared EDC to caucus. Uh, so as you can see, EDC, you will see anterior half of radial head, caucus, you see posterior half of radial head. Now your Mason's classification and your radial head fractures, you know, 80% happens in anterolateral quadrant. So doing a EDC makes sense in those cases. And then of course, the, if I'm anterior, like I am here, I'm preserving my lateral ulna collateral ligament. Again, uh, indications are same as cockers. You can use it for your terrible tries, for your radial heads, for your septic elbows. Extended EDC, all it means is you further go up the supracondylar ridge, brachial is, is elevated in the front, triceps behind, and then for we'll sort of for all those capitalum fractures, which has posterior combination, and you want to put a posterior plate along with screws, uh, you have to do extended EDC split. And then of course, in some terrible trials, uh, by doing a, a extended approach, you can see capsule better. And again, this is a terrible triad. Mr. Fudness will uh, tell us a lot more in detail, but if your radial head can come out, then you can do your capsular repair from the lateral side only. So retrograde drills and stitches to capsule, replace the head, LUCL repair on the isometric point, and then capital and fracture uh, is another indication. Kaplan's is a further anterior approach between EDC and ECRB. But remember, the more anterior we go, now pin comes into play. So we have to talk about posterior and tortuous nerve in all the lateral approaches. And that's why we pronate to keep the nerve away. So what this paper told us was that from the top of the radial head, if you go five centimeters distal, roughly on an average, that's where the first motor branches are given. Now, other papers will say it's two and a half centimeter. And as we pronate, excursion is a centimeter, nerve will go further distal by a centimeter and sort of goes, falls away from our plane. So every postrolateral approach, we pronate, and for exam purposes and even practically, your safe zone is three to three and a half centimeter. Medial approach, there are four flexors. Uh, and your three approaches, Hotchkiss, Ring and Taylor. Exam purposes, bring up, bring into discussion. Medial approach equals the ulnar nerve. Few points about uh, ulnar nerve that we need to know. Best place to identify three to four centimeter proximal to medial epicondyle next to medial triceps, especially in a uh, revision situations or trauma situations. Then look for Osborne's ligament, slide your McDonald's like your carpal tunnel, incise it. Look for medial intermuscular septum, that's your septum. Again, uh, incise it, especially in the revision situations uh, or uh, sort of in the, when you're transposing the nerve anteriorly because uh, if the septum is not excised, the nerve will flick over it and it will be irritable post-operatively. Then two heads of FCU, decompress the nerve, be aware of motor branch to FCU, look at the quality of nerve, make a recording, and then the anti-brachial cutaneous nerve. So Hotchkiss is the approach, is the over-the-top approach or 50-50 approach. So divide your four tendons into two, and then uh, go between FCR and Pomaris longus. Indication will be the uh, tip of coronoid fractures. Ring approach, this is the one to bring in the exam because it's through the bed of ulnar nerve. Uh, and we've all decompressed ulnar nerves in our practice. So what I'm showing here is white arrow shows ulnar nerve, yellow arrow is FCU. I've sort of inside, decompressed the nerve through the two heads of FCU. You can see violet arrow shows ulnar nerve. That's FCU. This is FCU. And then in this case, given the complexity, I have taken off the flexor origin. So this circle is the whole flexor mass. Uh, so basically it represents PT, FCR, upper maris longus and anterior half of FCU. Other half is there. And then as I go through capsule, you can see I'm holding the anterior band of it. Uh, 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 MCL, which is ruptured, and the anteromedial facet, and we can address those with screws or plates. And then another different case, terrible triad, 
anterior band intact, pulled off the whole facet. Again, medial ring approach, drop a sort of hold this down with a plate, some retrograde drills for capsule, and then a separate small lateral incision for your LCL repair. Again, Mr. Fudness will talk about it in a lot more detail. Taylor approach is basically where you lift all the four flexors anteriorly as shown here in the AO slides. Indication is coronoid fracture, which is extending into the olecranon. Anterior approach, busy slide, but this is being recorded, this lecture, so you can read it later. If for exams, this approach will be brought into discussion in a displaced supracondylar fracture where brachial artery is severed and you've got a pulseless white hand. So again, after liaising with vascular surgeons, uh, you will talk about this approach. So lazy S incision, as you incise the bicipital uh, eponeurosis, uh, which is protecting the artery and nerve, will be straight down to artery, uh, tag it and send it to vascular surgeons after reducing NK wiring your supracondylus. And then of course, uh, if you are shown a trochlear fracture or an anterolateral facet fracture, some elbow surgeons would like to do an anterior approach. So at this stage, in figure D and E, uh, once I elevate the brachialis and the capsule of the coronoid, I'm straight down into the trochlea and the anterolateral facet. So you can discuss that in the exam. Posterior approach, olecranon and osteotomy or trap approach. Indications are a comminuted distal humerus intraarticular fracture. Again, I would do it in a lateral position. Some surgeons can, would, would do it in a supine. So again, you make your skin flaps, decompress your ulnar nerve. Next step, olecranon and osteotomy. Uh, so I would put a plate, pre-drill, plate comes off. I would do a chevron osteotomy, bare area, start with a saw, then an osteotome. I have in this case taken anconius with triceps, stitch it back up, temporary wires. I've done a parallel plate, as Mayo told us. Mr. Singh later today will tell us the advantages, disadvantages, indications of parallel versus perpendicular plating. And then, of course, be aware of the radial nerve also. Sometimes it can be a bit distal and it can be very close to your plate. And then finally, I put a plate to repair the olecranon. And this triangular thing is my anconius. So remember the nerve supply is given off in the spiral groove and comes down in this direction where I'm pointing with the arrow. So by doing a trap flap, triceps anconius pedicle flap, I'm preserving the nerve supply. Boyd interval approach, indications, radial heads, montegias, some surgeons will address terrible triads through this approach. Again, lateral position, uh, make nice flaps, fascia, leave a little strip, uh, two, three millimeters of cuff to repair anconias, elevate anconias of the subcutaneous border of ulna. And then as I take off my annular ligament and LUCL of the supinator crest, which is this rounded thing pointed by black arrow, I'm on to radial head. Now I can fix it, replace it. I can put a plate on ulna. I can extend the incision proximally for my terrible triads. And in the end, a transosseous repair to my annular ligament and the whole LUCL complex. Again, very nicely described by Robinson and uh, uh, Mr. Rensberg. If some of you want to have a read on void interval approach. Finally, lateral para olecranon approach. Again, nice paper by Graham King. Indications, total elbow arthroplasty, distal humerus, comminuted intraarticular fractures, where you're not sure if you can fix it or would you have to replace it. Then distal humerus articular surface fractures involving capitulum and trochlea with anterior and posterior comminution, where again, you do not know if you can fix it or would you end up doing a hemi or a elbow replacement depending on age group. This is a good approach. Again, I would do it laterally, like your Boyd, like your trap approaches, uh, uh, I would look for ulnar nerve, lift off anconias, further go up and take off one third triceps. So medial two third triceps stays onto a late renal, which is your main triceps tendon. So it's a triceps on approach, which means early rehabilitation, early range of motion, and you get a better movement and a better strength. And then of course, take off MCL, LCL, flexors and extensors. 
then you can deliver your humerus or your ulna. Now you can do an elbow replacement. You can fix your humerus as the case may be. Uh, again, uh, we wrote a paper earlier last year on uh, surgical approaches, a comprehensive review. That's a paragraph on this approach from that paper. If you get a chance uh, and you feel like you can have a look. Uh, and finally, uh, this is my website. On the menu bar, that's my YouTube channel. I've got lots of lectures pertaining to FRCS uh, exams. Uh, if some of you want to have a sort of a look. Thank you very much for, for listening, for your kind thank attention. Uh, thank you, Saurabh, uh, for a wonderful talk on um, the approaches to the elbow. It's um, one of the key things to identify which approach to use for which fracture. And I think, as they say, that if you've got a good approach, then that's half of your job done. Um, thank you. Next, we're going to uh, do Roger's uh, talk. I'll let Saurabh introduce Roger. You are on mute, Roger. Um, Saurabh. Yes. Thank you, uh, Prof. BJ, for your kind introduction and for the opportunity. Now, Professor uh, Van Wright, he's a dedicated elbow surgeon. Uh, he works at uh, Antwerp University Hospital, Orthoka Group, and also now presently based in Harley Street. Uh, he's a renowned uh, elbow surgeon with over 100 peer-reviewed papers on elbow surgery and more than 50 book chapters. He also runs a arthroscopy courses in elbow and cadaver courses. He was also a former president of Belgium Elbow and Shoulder Society and a member of many national and international societies. Uh, unfortunately, today for personal reasons, he uh, cannot attend, but he's kindly given us his recorded uh, presentation, which we'll play for you. And we'll be happy to answer any questions uh, from the candidates. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Roger Van Giet. Um, I was asked to talk about intra-articular distal humerus fractures. I work at uh, orthopedic specialist in Harley Street Specialist Hospital and uh, Ortoka uh, in uh, Antwerp. I'm a designer of Acumed and I'm a designer of the Exo Elbow by Jake Design. The incidence of distal humerus fractures is about 5.7 per 100,000 people per year. 2% of adult fractures. Men are younger, with a peak in adolescence, high energy. Women, often osteoporotic with low energy, simple falls. So fall from a standing height accounts for about 60% of distal humerus fractures, and obviously this is, this is very often in brittle bone. There's an anatomical classification, obviously an AO classification as always, and I was asked to talk about intraarticular fractures, which is type 13B3, frontal or capital shear fracture. We won't go into that in too much detail. And then uh, type 13C and the C-type fractures are the dreaded ones. Articular simple, metaphysial simple, articular simple, metaphysial multifragmentary, or articular multifragmentary everywhere. And this is the one that we all dread. Obviously start with plain radiographs. Um, I literally always will do a CT scan very often with uh, 3D reconstructions not just for me, but also for the patient. And uh, now I'm, I'm happy to work in a hospital where we can actually print these. So if we feel this is a very complex fracture pattern, I can uh, ask our engineer to print them and uh, a couple of hours later we'll have it. So treatment options include surgery, osteosynthesis, resection, arthroplasty, uh, hemiarthroplasty or total elbow. Conservative treatment depends on the fracture, but more importantly, it depends on patient factors age, activity le levels, again osteoporosis, was there osteoarthritis, yes or no, if there's a really bad elbow maybe you don't want to do a heroic uh, osteosynthesis but you might prefer to go to total level replacement immediately and then general health status, can we actually operate on this patient? This is a 90 year old patient with a uh, uh, you know almost non-displaced uh, distal humerus fracture, um, she was in a plaster for two weeks, we took her out of the plaster for gentle mobilization this is at four weeks, and here you can see the callus that formed at four weeks with no displacement, which is obviously very important. And uh, this is her result at two months. And I can tell you that even in my hands, or you know, in my hands, um, 
uh, this is not uh, uh, generally the result at two months after either osteosynthesis or um, a total level replacement even. So non-operative further surgery, there's a little bit of um, a literature there. Uh, three times more likely to have an unacceptable result, six times higher non-union rate. However, in elderly it might do okay, but it's definitely non-anatomical. <coughs> the goal for surgery is immediate mobilization. You want to get a perfect or near-perfect reduction, that's why we open it up. And you want stability of fixation, so again, patients can start mobilizing immediately. Take care of the skin, because sometimes the skin will um, uh, make rehab a little bit more difficult, so sometimes you have to protect the patient, despite the fact you want to get them going. An open wound is obviously worse. Surgical outcome is reasonable. Uh, functional range of motion, uh, good to excellent to male performance score, but that's mainly based on pain, as you know. Dash score 20 to 45, not great. Strength 70%. Uh, and this is with patients that mobilize early within two weeks. There are some controversies. First controversy is the uh, approach. Do you use molecular osteotomy versus a paratricipital? Uh, do we uh, parallel plate or do we plate perpendicular? And then uh, last controversy, osteosynthesis versus hemi versus total level replacement. Um, whatever approach you use, you have to identify and protect the ulnar nerve throughout the procedure, and that's important. So always start the procedure with this. This is the approach that I prefer to use, and, and I haven't used a electron osteotomy in well, probably about five, six years. Um, par lateral parallelacron approach, and we'll go into that a little bit in a, in a minute. So tricep sparing versus osteotomy. Uh, 67 patients and they found osteotomy better outcome in patients over 60 years old. But unfortunately that's the uh, population that may need total level replacement and there's no difference in younger patients whether you use an osteotomy or not. If you do use an osteotomy for the younger um, uh, viewers, growth go through the bare area, almost everyone has one, uh, only 3% is continuous but you can miss it so so even if it is continuous you can, uh, you can put your thought through it. Yeah. There you see the older nerve, <coughs> inspect the damage, and this is probably one of my last cases where you collect enough stuff and you can run again. So what you do is you look for the bare area, yes. identify it, then grab your uh, knife or scissors or uh, in this case, uh, <coughs> coagulation, and mark the osteotomy site. We use a chevron osteotomy, and there's no real difference whether you use tranquils or chevron. Uh, it does look a little bit better on uh, on both of x -ray. Okay. So mark it. And we use an oscillating saw. Don't go all the way through the cartilage on the other side. But leave a little step um, for two reasons. Um, hopefully, the skin is less deep and the cartilage is still there. And then secondly, um, you get some stay with the edges. It makes it easier for um, to do the measurement as well. Some people prefer to put a plate on or screws in or, or uh, even uh, pinning uh, before. Uh, we tend to, uh, not to uh, but like I said, it's not much of the point. Look good. Uh, you look at this. Uh, excellent view of the decision. Uh, they start working from here. <coughs> and Wilkerson and, and uh, Stanley uh, published in 2001, 20 years ago. That they did find a better visualization in, in uh, their anatomical study, and less reoperations in a clinical study. However, complications are possible. It's extra hardware, it's longer surgery time, and uh, if it's extra hardware, longer surgery, you do get more complications. This is the lateral para uh, olecolon approach. It was described by uh, Graham King's group in 2013, Journal of Hand Surgery. If you hadn't, haven't read it, it's definitely worth the read. And um, it was actually Lee Van Rensburg who uh, uh, alerted me to this uh, approach several years ago, and uh, I, I haven't looked back since. So find the ulnar nerve, protect the ulnar nerve. We use a vessel loop. Don't put any instruments on the vessel loop so there's no pulling on the nerve uh, uh, because of the instruments. You just put a little knot in it, and that's it. The nerve is safe and happy. Then you can find the posterior capsule open the posterior capsule and depending on what you want to do you can leave it at this or you can release the uh, um, ligaments inside out. This was a fracture case where we did a prosthesis so we just removed a little fragment of this ligaments. Then, and this is important, identify the posterior part of the uh, olecranon and the subcutaneous border and leave a little flap of tissue, so leave a little fascia. See that's, that's what I'm holding up uh, 
uh, there with my forceps and that's very important because you'll need to suture it afterwards and if you cut straight on the subcutaneous tissue uh, subcutaneous border sorry then you don't have any tissue to suture later on so again same as on the medial side just go in and then uh, if you want you can uh, release ligaments and um, even uh, dislocate the elbow or just look underneath and get an excellent view this was with an older pair of tricipital approach, the Alonzo Yamas approach, 79 elbows, uh, about half had uh, triceps on. Only 24 were studied, so that's not a great study. Uh, they found no difference uh, with uh, either orthogonal or parallel plating, uh, and range of motion was comparable results to lacking on osteotomies. When you do osteosynthesis, do not use K wires, three times higher risk of poor outcome. Really should not be used in, uh, in adult uh, population, really don't. Perpendicular plating is classical. It's been tried and tested. Uh, there are advantages. You can go up all the way if you want. A little bit less dissection. And placement of the plate is definitely easier. However, they violate the blood supply of the capitellum, uh, which uh, in some fractures is a big deal. So uh, try to avoid um, stripping the posterior part of the capitellum too much. So increased range uh, risk of avascular necrosis. Then um, Sean O'Driscoll came up with the concept of parallel plating biomechanically. Really depends on the study you read. Probably de decreased rotational strength when we compared to parallel, but otherwise uh, very, very comparable. It's not perfectly parallel. Uh, as you can see here, it's about 160 degrees, so the, the um, uh, screws don't interfere with the plate. This is a big list, but um, we will go over this quickly, especially for the younger colleagues. This is something that has helped me a lot uh, uh, with my time at Mayo. In, in even in 2001, Sean was working on this, and we have this technical objective. So each, each distal screw should pass through a plate. Uh, each screw should engage a fragment on the opposite side that's also fixed to a plate. An adequate number of screws should be placed in the distal fragments, and th that's very important. So try to get um, screws that are very long so we have as many uh, fragments as possible. And if you get more screws in each fragment, obviously you get a bigger... Uh, um, a stronger fixation. So you don't have to adhere. This is not the the, you know, the Bible. You don't have to adhere to, to this, uh, um, but it does help uh, if you know these rules. Screws should interdigitate. And obviously not if you're using locking plates, but uh, this is one of the reasons why I don't like using locking plates if I can avoid it. Uh, get some compression. Don't forget because this is a site of non-union, so we're always very fixed on the on the articulation, but. Uh, non unions occur in uh, in this area at the supercondyle level, so make sure that it compresses. And obviously, the plates need to be strong enough, and I think uh, all commercial plates are the same now with regards to strength. This is a 73 year old male in uh, good health. Uh, we fixed it and um, <coughs> he did very well. This is an 85 year old with a distal humerus fracture, and we always talk to the patient. So, ask them, what, what do you want? We know from the study from um, uh, from Canada that, that uh, there is a difference in elderly patients, probably total elbow placement are a little bit faster and a little bit less uh, likely to get complications, but this was not a C3 type fracture, so this is still preferred to do an we still prefer to do an osteosynthesis in these patients. But we do talk to them. 65 year old, uh, this was uh, unfortunately unsalvageable. We tried, but we couldn't get this, uh, even on the table, we couldn't get this to be fixed. So we used a humeral hemi replacement. So this is, uh, Ulna uh, remains native, remains intact, and we put a, a hemi replacement in the ulna. <coughs> That's the advantage, there's no ulna component, and you can convert to total elbow placement if you need. However, no ulna component may lead to pain and cartilage wear. Revision is not as easy as it seems, so you, you think, okay, let's could just go in and, and uh, create a to convert it to a total, but it's not like that. It's obviously an elbow that had um, a problem, an uh, elbow that had surgery, and um, if you're an American, there's no FDA approval, but luckily we don't have to worry about that. So you need intact, repairable, or reconstructable medial and lateral columns, although, as you can see in my previous slide, I don't really care too much about the columns, um, and I've gone uh, become a little bit more aggressive. I don't tend to fix these. I, as long as I get a good soft tissue uh, stability, I'm happy. Obviously, the ulna needs to be intact, and the MCL and LCL need to be fixed. Instability, so an ulna that's not working well, is uh, definitely an, uh, a contraindication um, if the bone is really poor. And um, again, in, in a patient like this, you can put a hemi in, but obviously it's not going to work well because the, the ulna is going to be at 
very painful. Results of complication are comparable to uh, osteosynthesis or total lung replacement. Uh, Joy Deep, who just uh, who's, who's in this um, uh, meeting as well, has published on this. And we don't know what what the uh, effect of on erosion is. Maybe Joy Deep can talk about that a little bit later. Total lung replacement. Um, Mark Frankel and uh, McKee have, have published this. C3 type fractures, so they're really bad ones. A comminuted uh, articular surface, comminuted um, metaphyseal columns. Um, they'll have decreased complication, decreased reoperation rate, better motion, and basically just one surgery instead of multiple surgeries. So, so we have to talk to the patients. And like I said, I showed earlier, we, we do do osteosynthesis in elderly people for sure, but they have to have good bone, they have to have uh, be active, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And otherwise, we have some evidence backing this up that maybe they'll do better with uh, total lung replacement, although the evidence is only two years follow-up. So this is a 86-year-old, eight, probably is still fixable. Um, if it's a 24-year-old, uh, we would definitely give it a go. But as you can see, it's a relatively complex uh, fracture. <coughs> Still with the Kumra Mori, this one year post op, uh, she's happy, I'm happy. Uh, very, very good uh, operation for pain relief, relatively okay for, uh, for range of motion and uh, obviously bad for lifting. So we tell our patients not to lift too much, not more than five kilograms at a time, not more than one and a half kilograms repetitively. Three months post op. She's had a prosthesis in for now about five or six years, I think. I was afraid of the uh, of the um, shoulder prosthesis, of course, but luckily that, that hasn't been an issue. Seventy-five year old again, C three type fracture. Um, and you see, we get we get full range of motion on the table. So what's the literature tell us? This is Dr. Mori, uh, 45, 44 patients age uh, 70 years or older. Um, 25 patients died at uh, 10 years follow-up. Um, flexion extension was definitely in the uh, functional range. And like I said, vast score for pain, 0 0.6, 0 0.2, 4 on the max. So this is a very good uh, operation for pain. And, and we all know patients that had osteosynthesis distal humors that keep complaining about pain. However, 52% complication rate, 11% deep infection, 18% revision, and uh, 42 in surviving patients. So in this uh, series uh, with uh, the Kumwa Mori back then, uh, it definitely was not the last surgery, unfortunately, in uh, almost half. David Stanley, the other uh, uh, guru of elbow surgery, 37 patients, similar age, 72 years old. Again, uh, uh, 17 patients died. Um, flexion extension, nearly functional. May well perform a score 90 on average, so not a very excellent score on average. Again, 22% complication, 31% uh, loosening, and 14% revision, so a little bit better than Dr. Morris group. So in conclusion, um, it depends on the fracture and the patient. Conservative treatment does play a role in the uh, uh, medically unfit patient. Osteosynthesis is preferred. Hemi is an option, and total lower replacement is sometimes better but you have to make up your mind uh, together with the patient and together, obviously based on the fracture. Thank you very much. Uh, that was an excellent talk by Roger. And as we said, unfortunately, he couldn't be here. I've got one question. Maybe Joy, if you'll probably be able to answer that, is when do you decide um, between um, HEMI and a total for these uh, non-salvageable distal humerus fractures. Okay, so the, um, hello everyone. Um, so my decision really would be based on uh, the age of the patient and whether the columns are involved. So my, in the hemi is best suited to the very distal articular fractures where the columns are relatively preserved. Often there might be a small medium column extension and obviously the relatively younger, more active patients. So even if the patient's 70, 80, but active, I'd prefer to go for a, a hemiartoplasty. Um, and I'd reserve the total elbows for those people with either pre-existing arthritis, 
where there's a really severe fracture involving the columns because the hemis reliant on native stability um, or a very geriatric uh, patient where you, you want to do a, a linked implant that will just um, uh, give them a very basic function. So the fact is that in in most of the fractures where there is severe articular comminution, um, the columns aren't actually usually involved. So um, a hemi is suitable in my hands for most of those cases. So because, you know, the, um, the ligaments needs to be either intact or be repairable for you to do a hemi. Yes, yeah, so the, so the ligaments uh, are, are intact always. They're, they're just attached to the, the fragments. So um, it's whether you can fix the ligaments with the fragments uh, reliably. So, so in a in a say an open fracture where there's severe um, soft tissue damage and severe articular bone loss, then a hemi would be less reliable. Yes. Uh, yeah. Sorry, Saurabh, carry on. Yeah. No, thanks, Joydeep and Prof. B. J. I have one more question open to the panel. Uh, in these very comminuted uh, distal humerus intraarticular fractures, yes, we are allowed to use free headless screws, even though we want to minimize those, or even threaded wires. But in sort of your experience, is there ever have you ever come across a case where you couldn't fix those fragments, at least some of those, and you had to excise them and then use a tricortical eyelid crest graft or something? Yeah, so in, in the rare situation, again, I'll talk about an open fracture, for instance, because we have severe bone loss in the middle, in the central part of the joint, or multiple small fragments. What you need to do, uh, concentrate on, is restoring the lateral and medial column. So um, the medial trochlea and the capitellum. So you don't need to worry too much about the central fragments. What you don't want is them to... Uh, have AVN and then have metal work intraarticular. So again, in some of the elderly patients, if you concentrate, it's like, think of the, the, the elbow like a train track and the train running on the tracks. If you restore the tracks, you don't need the central bit. So, in, so you don't, rather than place lots of metal work, you can get away with that in, in the older patients. So you can excise that central piece to an extent and get away with it. Yeah, but you need you need stable fixation of, of the um, surrounding fragments. Perfect, thank you. Thank you, Jody. There's a few more questions. Uh, one, probably you're probably the best one to answer, I guess. Has anyone had to revise a HEMI to a TEA? Yeah, so in I've done, I think, 32 HEMIs now. I haven't had to revise one of my own. And anecdotally speaking to other people around the country, revision of a hemi to a total is very uncommon for wear. So there are, in the literature, there are the odd case, but it is very uncommon. What the hemis have been revised for have been for loosening of the stem or infection. And I've revised one hemi from, sent to me from elsewhere for instability. And, and that was because the implant was placed in malrotation. So when I revised that, um, I, I changed that to a total for safety rather than, I, so I still revised the stem to get the rotation right, but changed that to a total elbow. Um, well, another question is, what do you do for the very distal fractures uh, with the radial head fracture is not salvageable? is hemi contraindicated yeah so um that's a very very rare situation firstly <laughs> where you would have such a severe radial head fracture and a um, unreconstructable distal humerus so uh, i haven't seen that situation and I, I can guess that most people wouldn't have seen that situation however um yes the hemi uh, you need stability so it it, that would be uh, contra relatively contraindicated unless you can fix the radial head. If you really can't fix the radial head and the patient is too young for a total elbow, then um, you could in theory replace the radial, radial head with the poly radial head from the latitude system um, and do a hemi. 
However, I, I would emphasize that is extremely rare and I, I've never done or encountered that situation. But I, so that's just thank me you, thank off you. the top of my head. Thank you, Jody. Um, sort of for you, what medial approach is the best for the sublime tubercle? And also for open reduction of supracondylar, I think it's more pediatric, but we can take it here as well. Supracondylar fractures with possible brachial artery injury. How do you decide which approach to use, anterolateral versus anterior? Right, and okay. is the global approach to elbow and more approach the same? Right, okay. So from a uh, medial approach uh, to sublime tubercle, uh, you can pick either of the two approaches. You can do over-the-top Hotchkiss approach. So your, uh, your plane will be between, some book says FCR and Palmaris longus, other book says between Palmaris longus and your FCU. But practically, it's very hard to know where you are. You see your ulnar nerve and sort of go anterior to it. Uh, or you can even use David Ring approach, the FCU split approach through the bed of ulnar nerve. Uh, only thing here is how to prevent damage to the anterior band of MCL. So once you decompress your ulnar nerve, uh, sort of you have, I always feel the sublime tubercle and then my dissection is further up, further anterior to it. So then I know I'm automatically not uh, doing any damage to the anterior band. So that's the key here in this approach. You can say either or in the exam. Practically, uh, I would do a, I'm more comfortable with the David Ring approach. So I would do that. Thank you. And then you were saying uh, supracondylar, open supracondylar. No, with right. med with the vascular injury, not open. So, okay. So first of all, one thing to appreciate in supracondylars is a uh, brachial artery can have intimal tears. It can go into spasm or which can result in radial pulses not being felt. So one needs to be aware of that. Second thing is, okay, let's assume a situation where it is actually severed. So once you've spoken to vascular surgeons uh, and if the fracture is very displaced, I would, still, uh, I would still do a double approach. I would stick to first. So I would first reduce my fracture as I would do any... Uh, supracondylars, which I cannot reduce close. So I would do a, a, my traditional lateral approach. I would reduce it. I would flex it completely to make sure it's reduced and there is no sort of catching of vessel or brachialis in between the fracture fragments. I would K-wire it. And then uh, if the pulses haven't sort of haven't been restored, then I would do an anterior approach after liaising with vascular surgeons and tag it. So I would start from a familiar territory, a lateral approach. Then if I feel pulses haven't come back, then I would go anterior. So I'll do a dual approach. Thank First you, Saurabh. I think for the sake of time, we should move on. Uh, next, we've got a talk by Joy Deep. Um, looking forward to this um, fantastic talk. Um, I do apologize to the attendees that it is slightly longer, but I can assure you that it's worth your while listening to this uh, talk. Uh, Joy Deep is a colleague and a consultant at um, Brighton University Hospital. I don't know whether he likes to say elbow and shoulder surgeon or just elbow surgeon, but um, he's the master of elbow surgery, certainly in the southeast um, uh, of England. I'm going to share this uh, presentation. My name is Joy Deep Fadness. I'm an elbow specialist working in Brighton in the UK and my talk today is going to be about understanding rotatory fracture dislocations and um, this encompasses terrible triad fracture dislocations. The objectives are really going to be to um, have an emphasis on understanding these injuries so we can treat them better. So we're going to do this by discussing the pathoanatomy, recognising the specific patterns of injury that are included and how um, this affects our decision-making and treating patients with these injuries. 
So we know that the elbow has primary and secondary stabilizers, the primary stabilizers being the coronoid, um, the uh, medial collateral and lateral collateral ligament. And when we talk about the coronoid, we're talking about the bony congruency of the ulnar humeral joint. And the secondary stabilizers are the uh, common flex origin, common extensor origin, and the radial head. We know that when we have a fracture and we have the soft tissue in, uh, structures injured, the radial head becomes more important and becomes upregulated as a, as a stabilizer of the elbow. The forces um, that lead to these injuries um, are a combination including axial load, varus and valgus uh, moments, as well as internal and external rotation forces to the ulnar humeral joint. So internal rotation, a pronation in the axial plane, and external rotation will put differential stresses on the ligaments. And it's this combination of um, forces that will lead to uh, two characteristic patterns of rotatory fracture dislocation. The first, um, which is analogous to the terrible triad injuries, the posterolateral lateral pattern, where there's a predominantly valgus and external rotation force. Whereas in the posterior medial pattern, there's a predominantly varus and internal rotation force. And recognizing which injury type we're dealing with is important. And the bony injuries that we see on the x-ray and CT will allow us to recognize um, the patterns. How do we do this? So if you look at the radial head firstly, in the posterior medial pattern, the radial head will tend to be intact because the elbow is internally rotated and subluxated. Therefore, the radial head has not been fractured um, either in shearing, as happens in the valgus posterolateral pattern, or by impaction when there's valgus against the uh, capitellum. So, in the uh, posterolateral pattern, the radial head will be fractured. The coronoid in the posterolateral terrible triad type pattern will tend to be anterolateral and tend to be smaller. And in the posterior medial pattern will um, involve this anterior medial aspect of the coronoid, will often be concave shaped and may extend further either into the sublime tubercle or into the uh, anterolateral area as well. And remember that the reason for recognizing these bony patterns is that they infer and dictate what soft tissue injury is present. The most important soft tissue injury to be aware of because it's the one that always needs fixing is the lateral collateral ligament. This arises from the uh, supinator crest of the ulna and inserts onto the lateral epicondyle and it's confluent with the annular ligament and the radial collateral ligament and it forms this hammock structure that is lifting and cradling the radial head up. It's responsible for varus and external rotation stability and it's injured in both PLRI and PMRI patterns. In the PLRI pattern, it tends to be injured with an external rotation force where we see this drop sign because the um, ulna has been rotated externally relative to the uh, humerus, as you see on the left. And in the PMRI pattern, it's predominantly a varus injury, um, as you can see in the right image. The medial collateral ligament um, is a really stiff, stout structure and the anterior band of the medial collateral is the strongest of the, um, the ligaments in the elbow. The posterior band, on the other hand, is thin and there's a condensation of the capsule and the two together are responsible for valgus and internal rotation stability. The anterior band um, is uh, injured in the PLRI valgus pattern. Sometimes it's intact and the elbow pivots around it and the posterior band tends to be injured in the PMRI internal rotation. So it's it's torn with internal rotation <coughs> and contributes to instability in the PMRI pattern. Remember that the, the MCL tends to be compensated well by intact um, common flexors and hence unless you have this situation where they're exploded apart we can treat the MCL non-operatively in many of these injuries. So in the sagittal, uh, so the coronoid's role is um, as a sagittal plane stabilizer. It um, provides an anterior buttress to dislocation, but it's also important for coronal plane stability, where um, the anterior medial facet resists varus uh, instability. 
Don't forget it's also important for axial and rotatory stability, particularly the anteromedial facet against internal rotation where the trochlea comes into contact with the anteromedial facet. And in this situation, this is where we might tear the lateral collateral uh, ligament from varus. It it's, um, has a less important role with um, external rotation stability because predominantly this is provided by the radial head. And in this situation, um, the lateral ligament will tear because of external rotation force rather than a varus injury. And you can notice that the tip region, i.e. the coronoid um, apex, doesn't really provide any significant stability from what I've shown you. We classify coronoid fractures ideally using a CT-based classification system as it's very important to recognize what area of the coronoid is fractured. As I've said, this will infer the ligament injuries and the instability pattern. And the emphasis of the O'Driscoll classification is on recognizing these anteromedial facet and basal fractures where the tip fracture is not uh, important. And remember, the anteromedial facet fractures can extend into the sublime tubercle, but most commonly they're in this region of the anteromedial slope of the um, coronoid. And they typically form this concave shaped defect from the medial trochlea. The writings and classification is uh, very similar to the uh, O'Driscoll in that it's recognizing the anteromedial and, ba uh, and basal fractures, and it's a simplified version uh, talking about an anteromedial facet and an anterolateral facet. It's important, I think, to emphasize posteromedial varus instability, as this um, is sometimes misunderstood. Remember, this is an internal rotation injury with combined varus that leads to varus subluxation of the um, uh, ulnar humeral joint and typically gives us a lateral collateral ligament avulsion in varus an internal rotation injury to the posterior band of the MCL and an anteromedial impaction fracture of the coronoid, which is typically this concave uh, shape. And this is why you can see the radial head is spared in, this, in these injuries because it's a, sub, it's a varus subluxation. This injury is really important to recognize because the chronic um, posteromedial and varus subluxation leads to increase um, joint reaction forces at the medial uh, trochlear articulation, which can lead to rapid post-traumatic arthritis. So we want to recognize these coronoid fractures and treat this injury early uh, and effectively to avoid the situation uh, where we might have in this patient who needed a, an early total elbow replacement. So with the knowledge that these anteromedial coronoid fractures are really important not to miss, do they all need fixing? And can any of these be treated non-operatively? And if so, which? And how do we recognize which of these injuries can be treated non-operatively? Um, can, is there a role just to repair the lateral ligament? And if so, how do we decide without causing um, problems with our patients? So let's look at some of the literature. Um, this biomechanical study by um, Graham King's group showed that um, all the sublime tubercle fractures, i.e. those involving the sublime tubercle type 3s, needed fixation because fixation of the lateral ligament alone wasn't enough. However, the smaller subtype 1, i.e. those common anteromedial fractures, could be treated uh, with lateral ligament repair alone. And the figure they um, thought about was around 5 millimeters in size as being the critical point for lateral ligament repair versus lateral ligament and uh, coronoid fixation. This um, clinical study by Antonio Fururia um, reported 38 patients who were treated non-operatively with an anteromedial coronoid fracture. Um, but the prerequisite were that all had to have an intact sublime tubercle, the joint was congruent under reduction, and the coronoid height was left at less than 50%. But remember, in this study, they immobilized the patient for four weeks in order to allow the lateral ligament to heal. But despite this, 10% had poor results, and this was because of lateral ligament insufficiency. 
This is a study that we performed with 43 patients and our findings were similar in that the patients that could be treated non-operatively had to have an intact sublime tubercle and a congruent joint reduction on imaging. And we used clinical testing to identify whether the lateral ligament um, was incompetent, this was the posterior lateral draw test, and whether the coronoid component of the injury led to varus grinding and subluxation, and this is called a varus stress test. And we found um, what our protocol was that if we found the lateral ligament was gone but the varus stress test was negative, we would go ahead and fix the lateral ligament alone. This is the posterior lateral draw test, and it's used to identify lateral ligament insufficiency. It's highly sensitive and specific for identifying this problem. And the various stress test, which is done in clinic and radiographically in theater, where you can feel grinding um, if the trochlea rides into that coronoid injury. When we look back at the cases, we found that the, the, the patients who had coronoid fractures over six uh, millimeters in size were the ones who always required surgical stabilization. So this is in keeping with the other studies regarding the size of the fragment. So if we go ahead and fix the coronoid fracture, what techniques can we use? We can use arthroscopic, using screws from posterior to anterior, and, and more commonly open procedures from anterior to posterior or PA or plate. What I would recommend against is using suture techniques to fix the coronoid. In, um, these are most commonly used when the coronoid fragments are very small. And what I've shown you so far is that these tip fractures and even the small anteromedial fractures don't need fixing and hence there's no role in my practice for using sutures to fix the coronoid or tighten the anterior capsule. Coronoid fractures in my practice, um, have a, there is a real role for arthroscopic fixation. If you have the arthroscopic um, experience to do this, it avoids the morbidity of medial exposure and I use this technique um, when the coronoid fracture is large enough and it's in one um, large fragment. And we have to do PA fixation in this situation. It really does avoid morbidity of the medialist approach. However, if I need to fix a, a larger coronoid or it's comminuted or I need to bone graft the coronoid, then I'll use a medial approach. It allows me full access to the coronoid. I can address the medial soft tissue structures and I can place plates and screws. And this is why I don't tend to use lateral or anterior techniques to fix the coronoid. This is the most common approach I would use to fix the coronoid. It's the uh, over the top approach and it goes through um, the interval between the anterior head of FCU and palmaris and we can extend it up the medial column to get, get more view. We can address MCL tears through this approach as well. And there are other approaches which I won't go into, but this is the main one to use. So what's the role of the radial head in this um, uh, in these injuries? Well, the radial head is responsible for valgus, uh, external rotation, and longitudinal stability, as I've already shown you, and it's critical in a fracture dislocation situation. So we shouldn't excise it. What happens if we excise the radial head with residual instability of the uh, rest of the joint is that we get um, rapid onset arthritis because of the increased forces that go through um, the ulnar humeral joint. Now, often these um, arthritic changes are asymptomatic many years later, but we know for sure that they do develop as compared to a, uh, a, an elbow with a radial head in place. So do we fix or replace the radial head? Well, um, for me, I consider replacement in fractures where there's a complete articular fracture, i.e. there's no continuity between the head fragments and the, um, and the shaft of the radius, and it includes the neck. If there's multiple fragments, or the fragments are very small but important to stability. Um, and th there's no hard and fast rules on the number of fragments in my practice, although we know that if you get over three fragments, it becomes more difficult, and we have to really consider every patient um, individually. If I'm performing a fixation, I try and avoid the use of plates where possible, and if the neck's involved, I'll use these um, tripod screws uh, to gain stability into the neck. However, there are certainly the occasional situations when we do have to use a plate, particularly in the younger patients where we, where we want to avoid 
um, uh, replacement or if there's diaphyseal extension uh, down towards uh, the radial shaft. So when we're doing a radial head replacement, we have to think about the bearing surface, the shape, whether it's anatomic or non-anatomic, and our fixation method when we're choosing a radial head replacement. But actually more important than all of this is the correct sizing and length uh, of the implant you place. In terms of sizing, um, the, remember that the radial head is slightly oval shaped rather than round and when we're sizing um, it's better to use the lesser diameter um, of, of the um, curvature of the radial head to choose and, uh, and it means we err on undersizing the implant which is good. The way I um, get the length right is I use the intraoperative landmark of the uh, lesser sigmoid notch. Um, and remember that the head should never be proud of this landmark, which we can see intraoperatively, and it gives us the perfect uh, view to line up the radial head. And I use this over radiographic methods. This is what happens with overstuffing. You see a, a widened lateral on a humeral joint with uh, persistent varus uh, and rotatory subluxation. Don't forget about aligning the radial head correctly. The radial neck aligns with the uh, axis of forearm uh, rotation, which lines up with the ulnar styloid. And a good surrogate for this intraoperatively is the distal aspect of the um, radial tuberosity. So aim for the stem tip to be lined up with the distal aspect of the radial tuberosity. Let's now put everything we've discussed into a uh, model where we discuss um, the elbow as having three columns, the medial column being um, the anterior medial facet of the coronoid with the medial trochlea and the lateral column being the um, radial head and capitellum with the central less important column being the anterior lateral facet of the um, uh, coronoid with the lateral trochlea ridge. If we think of these columns supporting a, a roof of stability with our lateral and medial collateral ligaments, uh, and we then um, think about a simple elbow dislocation where we lose the lateral and colla uh, medial collateral ligaments and the soft tissue structures. These tend to remain stable. Why? Because we have these um, columns intact and supporting our roof. If we now take away the anterolateral column, um, I have an anterolateral coronoid fracture. This um, is still a stable situation relatively because we have um, the important medial and lateral columns intact, so our roof remains stable. Now if we add a radial head fracture like we get in a terrible triad situation, then we have gross instability because we've lost our lateral column and our roof tips down and um, we get dislocation. And in this scenario, simply repairing the medial uh, sided structures isn't going to support the roof. And we need to support um, the roof back up with, by repairing or replacing the radial head. This gives us stability again. So why do we repair the lateral collateral ligament in this situation if we have stability? Well, don't forget we're talking about a two-dimensional concept and the lateral collateral ligament provides this axial rotatory stability. So um, the lateral ligament repair will restore the rotatory axial 3D stability of the elbow and this is critical uh, for this as well as, of course, varus stability. Now let's think about posteromedial instability with a small uh, anteromedial coronoid fracture. Well, in this situation, we're going to get tipping of the roof into this, but because it's a small fracture, we may um, achieve stability with a robust lateral collateral ligament repair. However, with a larger coronoid fracture, we're going to have much more instability. And this is that posteromedial situation where we get the trochlea driving into the um, coronoid defect on the anteromedial aspect and causing this grinding sensation and in this situation a lateral ligament repair alone isn't going to be enough we need to restore the medial um, anteromedial buttress and possibly even repair the posteromedial uh, ligament for that rotatory component of the injury so just finally to touch on some of the adjuvant treatments that are around for um, rotatory fracture dislocations. Internal bracing, I'm a big fan of this, um, both in the acute and chronic situation. 
and acutely I would use it when the soft tissues are really shredded, you've got an, almost an explosion of the soft tissues and we can't rely on primary uh, fixation with a suture anchor. Uh, and there's nothing complicated about internal bracing, we're essentially using, uh, uh, creating a, a suture based ligament either by placing anchors at either end of the ligament or um, transosseous tunnels with a, a, a braided suture. The internal joint stabilizer is a very clever uh, device that I do like, but for me its role really is in revision situations to get us out of uh, trouble in highly unstable elbows or protect uh, ligament reconstruction. So I wouldn't recommend its use for um, acute uh, for the acute scenario, uh, as if you follow the principles we've discussed, it, it won't be necessary. And then ex formal external fixation I use very rarely, maybe once a year. And the situation I would use this in um, is for a vascular injury, perhaps with compartment syndrome, or an infected um, elbow with uh, ligament insufficiency. So what are the rehab principles I employ? Um, we go for immediate range of motion afterwards. We do this with a supine rehab program to utilize um, gravity compressive force and we avoid um, various um, torque on the elbow for six weeks i.e. no shoulder abduction beyond 45 degrees and no weight bearing through the arm but it's critical that the patient gets moving immediately to um, utilize the, f uh, the contraction of those dynamic stabilizers to um, compress and rehab the elbow I don't use any bracing or splinting as I find uh, this is unnecessary if we get uh, a primary stability with our surgery. So just to summarise, um, we've discussed uh, how to understand and interpret imaging to um, assess what pattern of instability you're dealing with. This is really important so that we can individually tailor the surgery to the specific injury pattern in order to um, choose which structures are most important to uh, fix. I'd urge you all to assess um, the imaging in, in detail and with particular emphasis on looking at the coronoid and understanding whether that coronoid fracture that you have is contributing to stability and whether it needs fixing or not. And remember, all lateral collateral ligaments need uh, repair in every one of these injuries and never excise the uh, radial head as it's particularly important in these rotatory fracture dislocations. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, um, on its own. Um, excellent presentation. Um, so one, one of the things that I sometimes struggle with is how to decide which approach? I mean, decided there's a coronoid fracture as well as a radial head. Um, when it's a simple dislocation, when it's a simple, simpler with the radial head fracture and the medial side looks intact or coronoid is not broken, it's easier. How to decide whether you're going to use a single posture approach or you're going to use the parallel uh, incisions uh, for uh, for tackling these? So um, one question is whether you need to fix both sides. And so the talk has sort of covered, um, covered that, the decision making. So in terms of incisions, um, I, I, was, I did a fellowship with Greg Bain and he sort of um, popularized the extensile posterior approach. But in my sort of my own practice, I've gone away from that. So I much prefer using separate medial and lateral incisions which and it means we really don't get any seromas. We move straight down to the structures of interest and you retain that posterior soft tissue. And I think the infection rate and the uh, hematoma rate with the large flaps that we create posteriorly um, is it, it, just unnecessary, I think, when we're doing the... So, so I would always plan my surgery based on the imaging and examination, start with, usually start with the lateral side and then make a separate medial incision. I agree with Joy, you know, I found 
which is a really better than using a big approach and then having the risk of seroma and infection and skin problems. Uh, Joy Lee. Yeah. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Excellent talk as always. I've heard lots of your talks. Uh, now I have one question, how or what dictates whether you would use a anatomic radial head replacement or a non-anatomic any particular sort of cues to it or is the jury still out how do you decide um the jury is still out really um the advantages there are some theory theoretical biomechanical advantages to the anatomic radial head but the flip side is that it's it, you need to put it in in the correct <laughs> anatomic rotation so um I, I've used both. Uh, my preference initially was a, a non-anatomic press fit um, um, pyrocarbon coated radial head. They stopped manufacturing the pyrocarbon, so now we're using the anatomic radial heads. What I would say is that you don't need to use radial heads with very long stems. There are some implants out there with stems that go beyond the radial tuberosity all the way down, and I think it's unnecessary. My experience with the pyrocarbons were that, that they had very short stems, but we've got hardly any loosening. So if you're going to use a press fit, try and avoid you losing bone stock with, with longer stems. But the jury's out on the anatomic component of it. Sure. And as you said in your presentation, key is the height, because you don't want to overstuff. Yeah. Equally, you do not want to understuff a lot also. And the key is the uh, diameter of the radial head. So err on the smaller size. Yes. Now, am I right in understanding that ro so far as rotation is concerned, because radial head is oval, it is a bit forgiving in the sense you can get away even with 30 degrees of mal rotation. Am I correct in understanding that? Um, what do you mean by mal rotation? So, so, you know, if the head is not put in a correct sort of that oval alignment yeah. so, so you're talking about if you use an anatomic radial head so if you're using a porous coated press fit anatomical head so you've got the size of the head right you've got the height right but you've not got the rotation right you know that oval yeah. part okay so yeah i suppose it depends what you mean by getting away with it so if you're doing an anatomic head head shape the reason you should be doing it is because it better replicates the um, the contact forces against the capital. So I think if you're not in the correct um, rotation, you're not going to achieve that goal. But you will still get away with it in terms of stability of the joint. But then that means you don't need to use an anatomic <laughs> radial head. So rotation is not that forgiving. Yeah, I, I, do, I think the biomechanical studies show that, that are based on it being in the correct rotation. So I don't know the data, but if it's not in the correct rotation, then you're not achieving that goal. It's just that you will, you will get away with it because what we're looking at is stability, not, not at the wear pattern. Okay, thank you very much. There's a question, um, uh, Joy Deep. Uh, in the young patient with... Uh, badly malunited radial head and stiffness. Would you excise the radial head and do an arthrolysis or is there any other alternative? Yes, yeah, that's a good question. And uh, so if you have a malunion of the radial head with stiffness following an instability, um, it all depends on whether when you excise the radial head, because that is the best way of restoring the rotational movement and doing an arthrolysis. Um, whether the elbow remains stable or not. So in those situations, I have tended to always have a radial head replacement available to put it in. Uh, but there are definitely situations where I've felt the elbow is totally stable because the ligaments have healed. And then it is reasonable just to simply excise the radial head and perform an arthrolysis. But we don't know for sure which one is best. We do know that without the radial head, that elbow will get arthritis slightly earlier, but you may hesitate about putting an implant in, in a stable situation. Thank Can you. I ask something? Yeah, yeah. check one, go on. Uh, excellent talk, Joy Deep. Um, you, you mentioned about the suture fixation for the 
so so we understand that if it's involving the anterior medial facet doing a suture fixation is not going to sort the problem it needs a plate or a screw but there are some surgeons who would fix the radial head or replace the radial head and they would still put suture in the anterolateral fragment or in the capsule there what would you say about that I, I personally don't think that's important and i know there's some very good prominent surgeons who do that and they, um, they would say that there's some proprioceptive benefit from the capsule to doing that. But my, if you think like we went through the columns, that anterolateral part really isn't important as long as you address the other structures correctly. And the, the, the reason most people use sutures is they say the coronoid fragments are too small for fixation. And I've shown you in the talk that if the coronoid fractures are so small, less than five millimeters, particularly in the anterior lateral part, they're not important for stability. So I don't think you gain very much by adding sutures. Does it cause a problem? Probably not, but I think it's unnecessary. And, and it, probably makes it has no relation to the drop sign. No, that's all from the lateral ligament. So I would, I would spend 20 minutes more concentrating on your lateral ligament structure or adding some robustness to that with a brace if you're worried, rather than spending 20 minutes drilling holes and putting sutures in. What do you say about when intraoperatively you have the drop sign, but when you start eccentric exercises and the patient is awake, there will be some correction of the drop sign when the, when the biceps and the brachialis start to contract? Yeah, so in so Graham King's published on that. He's talked about um, using a um, a, drop, a, a rehab program to help. But he, so I think if you have a drop sign post op, you might want to try that. But we shouldn't be expecting to have a drop sign intraoperatively. So you shouldn't leave the theatre with a drop sign saying I'm going to use exercises. You need to then readdress why you've got that because you don't want to leave theatre with any instability. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Okay. Uh, uh, so, any further questions uh, on? Uh, no, I think for time we should just carry on to the next one, sir. Okay. Sure. So, our next speaker is Mr. Jagwan Singh. He's a friend and a colleague. He trained from Brightington, and now he's a shoulder and elbow surgeon uh, at Queen Elizabeth Hospital Village, and he's very active in ac academics. So over to you, Jagwant. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jagwant Singh. I'm one of the elbow and shoulder surgeons at Lewisham and Greenwich Trust. Thanks to BIOS for giving me this opportunity. My talk is on different plating techniques in distal humerus fractures. We will be talking about the orthogonal plating, then the principles of parallel plating, the comparison between the two, and some case examples. Distal humerus fractures are complex injuries. Using parallel or orthogonal plating depends on fracture pattern and surgeon's preference. The key for successfully treating uh, distal humerus fractures is anatomic reduction intraoperatively and ensuring that we have a stable fixation which allows for early range of movement and preventing stiffness of the elbow. When we talk about orthogonal plating, this was originally recommended by AO. Jesse Jupiter and his group described the technique and their first results from a retrospective series in 1985. It involves fixation of the articular fragment with one or two uh, screws placed in a coronal plane, followed by fixation followed by plate fixation. This technique did have limitations. The concept of parallel plating was conceived 
because some surgeons felt that orthogonal plated, plating failed to provide adequate fixation of the distal fragments. This suboptimal anchorage between the distal articular fragment and the shaft humerus led to the failure at the supracondylar level. The reason for this was there was limited fixation due to limited screw and the limited screw length. <clears throat> also, if we were protecting the uh, fixation, this led to immobilization for a longer time and stiffness of the elbow. The rationale for the parallel plating was that longer and more screws in the in the articular fragment would give us a better stability and then also allow for supracondylar compression which a posterolateral plate failed to give dr odriscoll and his team from mayo clinic gave us these principles of parallel plating there are eight principles, six of them are related to screw and two to the plate fixation. So the Mayo team told us about that each screw should pass through the plate, engage a fragment onto the opposite side, which is also fixed with the plate. Adequate number of screws should be placed in the distal fragments and the screws should be as long as possible engage in as many articular fragments as possible and create a kind of an interdigitation lock fixed angle structure linking the columns together regarding the plate we have to try and achieve compression at the supracondylar level to prevent the non-union which we saw with the orthogonal plates at the supracondylar level and also that the plates should be strong and stiff enough prevent any breaking on bending before the union occurs. So this is how we see that as many screws as possible, they're interdigitating and um, holding the construct with closing the arch. And it's just like a reinforced concrete type of a top type of a construct. When we compare the orthogonal to the parallel plating, in terms of biomechanical studies, um, there are conflicting outcomes. But all these studies do show similar kind of a mechanical stiffness and fracture stabilization. Some studies do favoring the orthogonal and some parallel types of fixation. When we talk about various loading, screw loosening, and axial and sagittal loading, the in parallel plating does seem to have some benefit. Fixation does depend on the bone quality. But when we have an intraarticular fracture with metaphyseal defects, parallel plating is recommended. The superiority of the parallel plating is especially relevant in cases where we have limited bone contact. So for, for, for any intraarticular fracture with metaphyseal defects, parallel plating does seem to have a little edge. Looking at clinical studies then, this is a meta-analysis comparing six different randomized controlled trials nearly 350 patients. Orthogonal plating does take longer to union time, but there is no difference in clinical outcomes and com complication rates. It's only that the parallel plating is slightly superior in terms of fracture healing times. Thus to conclude, both these techniques have satisfactory outcomes. When to use orthogonal or parallel plating 
depends more on the fracture pattern, the quality of the bone, and also the surgeon's preference. For a successful management of a distal humerus fractures, it's important to know the morphology of the fracture with preoperative CT scans, intraoperatively to achieve anatomic reduction and get a stable construct so that we can allow early range of mobilization in patients and prevent future complications. I'll be taking a few case examples. The first patient is a 48 year old skateboarder. He fell down, sustaining a distal humerus fracture. CT scan revealed a T type configuration of the distal humerus fracture. Now, in an FRCS exam, the examiner will be expecting you to discuss the approach, the principles of fixation parallel plating and the anatomy with regards to ulnar nerve, radial nerve. We fix this on the principles of parallel plating and the oligonon osteotomy has been closed with the tension band wire. This is bony union achieved at three months. So it's important to talk about the approach, which Saurav has already discussed. Another patient, 53-year-old, he has got a coronal element to his fracture here, as we can see. This required multiple headless cannulated screws to fix the uh, articular fragments and then orthogonal plating because of the Comminution, we protected it for some time in the in the plaster and it achieved union. So that is it from my side. I'm happy to take on any questions. Thank you. Uh, Jagwan, thank you very much. It's an important sort of topic and very important to get head around as to when to use orthogonal plate because we will always use par so parallel plate that's the instinct, but there are some fracture patterns where I feel one should use a uh, orthogonal plating system. So no, thank you very much. I think it's just a fracture which dictates it and parallel okay. plating should be your go-to method. But if the fracture is of a morphology which requires coronal screws and a per perpendicular plating, we should use that in, in, in selective cases. Absolutely. Can I, Prof. BJ, is it possible to bring uh, the last two slides where uh, Jagwant has put a orthogonal plate. One second. So whilst I load that, can I ask, I, you nicely gave that uh, demonstration of fixing the osteotomy, one with tension band wire and one with a plate. Yes. Now, to both you, Joydeep uh, and Sora, when do you decide how do you decide which one to use? Um, because I personally use a long cancellous screw and a tension band wire. That's been my very standard way of fixing osteotomies. Sure. Uh, of course, Joydeep is the master of elbow. Uh, I can attempt to answer your question and Joydeep can then correct me. So uh, I feel a uh, tension band, it tends to, it's not a benign device. It's not a easy to get a very perfect tension band if you like. So the wires become prominent, they impinge on the skin, they back out, they can perforate the skin. So in, and again, with the cancellor screw, I know prof, that's why you're a professor, you have a lot of experience. Screw has to be directed, like it's not that easy to put a simple straight one cancellor screw and achieve union. It has to go in a particular direction, which comes with experience. So I stick to a simpler plate because I feel it's a bit uh, low profile and the chance of me removing the plate is a bit less compared to tension band. So that's my rationale of using a plate in an olecranon osteotomy. I would do a tension suture now. 
time doing an osteotomy because I think that is a much better way of uh, dealing with this. And uh, after doing, a, after fixing a distal humerus, you're tired and you want to just quickly do the operation. And I think tension suture is going to be I, more, more and more used for fixing the osteotomies. Yeah, sure, right. In, uh, Joydi, what, what are your thoughts? So, yeah, firstly, with practice and using the par learning the parallelecranon approach, you will need the osteotomy less. But it's totally reasonable to do an osteotomy if you, uh, to, to get it right. So, if I'm doing an osteotomy, my personal way is to use a, a, a cancella screw, so a, a partially threaded screw. The, as you said, Sarah, there are a couple of points you need to be aware of. So it needs to be in the line of the diaphysis to avoid the various angle in the ulna and also on the lateral view. And in order, and I put a tension suture for rotational control, like um, BJ instead of a tension wire. Um, the trick is to do it early. So whatever device you're going to do, do it at the beginning. So I pre-drill it, tap it. And it has to be usually about 90 to 100 millimeters to engage the diaphysis. And any of the techniques are fine, but they all have some certain problems. With, with, I, I'm a big fan of the tension suture technique. However, I, in our series, we found that they, uh, when you do it for an osteotomy, mm -hmm. they take longer to unite. And I think that's because you're creating a, um, a, a, a foot, you're creating a fracture. There's a bit of thermal necrosis and there's a bit of bone loss with an osteotomy. So my experience was that they took longer to unite. If you're going to use that technique, add an extra circular suture for safety, I'd recommend. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Prof, are we able to see those last two sort of at least the pre-operative picture where x-rays where Jagwant has done an orthogonal plating? Yes, one second. I'm just going to try and... And it one. Huh. Yeah, and if we go one slide back, please. So it's important to talk about the approach, so which the, sort of has yeah, already discussed. Yeah. So there were two things. Yeah. Thank you, Prof. Uh, two Another things. Another really, patient, fifty-three. So two things really. Uh, uh, sort of two observations to the whole panel, and let's see what we think about it. Now, first thing was, uh, in this case, on the X-ray on the left, there is a capitulum and there's a posterior combination. So e. Yes, Jagwant has beautifully used those screws, but then because of posterior combination, I feel we were obliged to do an orthogonal plate to put a postural lateral plate to buttress from behind. So I felt if someone had done a parallel plate here, it may not have been a very wise decision. Let's we'll see what Joydeep has to say and Prof has to say. And yeah. the second thing really was now, will am I like? Am I, can I label it as an articular surface fracture, a distal humerus articular surface fracture rather than a distal humerus intra-articular fracture? So two things really, and I'll uh, prof or joy deep if you want to take the question. Yeah, so I, I think you're absolutely right to call this a, a predominantly articular fracture. And do you remember what I said about the, when I was asked about hemi versus total elbow? Now, this patient's 53, I'm not proposing an arthroplasty, but in these severely comminuted articular fractures, you notice how the columns are spared. So this is one, if the patient was suitable, a hemi would be better, not a total elbow, just as an example. Um, I agree that you need to be able to control the coronal fragments with your fixation, um, whether you use independent screws or a posterior lateral plate. I like the plates. There are some plates that are posterolateral, but I call them hybrid plates because they have an outrigging device that comes and allows you to place lateral to medial screws. And that's the type of plate I would use. And in this case, I think it's right to use a medial plate as well because the fracture line goes, 
out through the medial um, epicondyle, which it doesn't always do in these fractures. Right. So basically, if it was the right decision to do an orthogonal plating, and parallel plating wouldn't have been a right thing to do, and it's an articular surface fracture. Yeah. Yes, but I would. I do like having that lateral outrigger to allow me to put some parallel screws as well, because I think having fixation in different planes is very valuable. Sure. Thank so you. I, I I take your point, Joy. The, I think we have the old style, the Acumet plates, but the newer plate from the Medartos and others, they have that capacity. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Sort of, do you want to wrap it up, please? Yeah, sure. Yeah, first of all, uh, thank you to all the participants for taking out your time. Uh, and we had some great speakers, and I hope it will benefit you a lot. And good luck for your exams. And uh, yes, a big thank you to, to our faculty, to, to Professor Wright, and I wish him all, all the good wishes for his personal sort of problems that he's going through at the moment. Big thank you to Joydeep, uh, Jagwant, and of course, Professor Bijay, who's my mentor and who's always supported me. Thank you, all of you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Great to see you guys. Thank you. Thank you.